Everybody. I see we've got a couple of hundred people um, who are slowly milling into the live chat. Uh, my name is Richard Medhurst. I have a very special guest with me today, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who's a linguist, uh, historian, political analyst, and activist, uh, university professor, and author of over 150 books, who really needs no introduction from me. Uh, Mr. Chomsky, how are you? It's a pleasure to have you on. Very pleased to be with you. Uh, sir, if I could, if I could just start with um, Biden administration foreign policy. You know, since uh, Joe Biden has taken office, uh, we we've seen him maintain a lot of the same uh, sanctions on Syria, Iran, uh, the Trump policies of uh, the the Caesar Act, for example, and and pulling out of the nuclear deal. Um, I, I've covered the nuclear deal in Vienna, but uh, as you know, it's gone into a deadlock, so nothing's really changed on that front. Uh, he also kept the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem um, and uh, maintained Trump's position that the Syrian, the occupied Syrian Golan Heights are Israeli. Could I just get your thoughts on, on Biden's foreign policy towards the Middle East and why it hasn't changed? It's basically an extension of Trump's foreign policy. It goes even beyond what you described. So one of the things they did, of course, he did accept uh, Trump's entire policy on uh, on Israel, the relations with the reactionary Arab states. Uh, he made some gestures about uh, trying to reach, uh, renew the, the nuclear agreement with uh, the joint agreement with Iran on nuclear weapons, but that backed down, uh, went on in fact to make an important decision which hasn't been reported very much, namely shifting the uh, shifting Israel from the U European command to CENTCOM, the Middle East command. Uh, that means that Israel is now, uh, Israel had always been kept out of that because of its uh, conflict with the Arab states. But uh, now that uh, the more or less tacit uh, relations with the reactionary Arab dictatorships have risen to uh, open uh, arrangements and with, of course, Israel shifting even further to the right, it's very natural alliance, uh, Israel has been shifted into the Middle East Command, for the US Middle East Command, and Israel and the United States have been carrying out pretty extensive joint military operations, increasing uh, through the Biden years, uh, clearly aimed at Iran. Uh, in fact, uh, US ambassador to Israel in, in his last, just recently informed Israel that uh, if they attack Iran, the uh, United States will support them. And the joint military operations are plainly aimed at that. Uh, Biden has, uh, he did make some gestures about cutting back on U.S. support for the Saudi uh, assault on Yemen. That's all forgotten. Uh, so by now, after some gestures, it's generally pretty much to back to Trump's foreign policy. Also, much went well beyond it in other ways, like the heating up the confrontation with China. 
mm. is way beyond what the Trump administration did. Uh, can discuss Ukraine probably what Trump would have done. Yeah, he did make one uh, move that was different. Uh, uh, Trump had uh, George, uh, during this century, the Republican administrations have essentially dismantled the uh, arms control regime, which had been laboriously put together for 60 years and was reasonably effective in mitigating the dangerous effects of nuclear war. Uh, the second Bush, W. Bush, uh, he eliminated the, the uh, ABM treaty, which was quite serious, also a major threat to Russia, part of the provocation of Russia that's been going on. The uh, uh, Trump came in, uh, dismantled the uh, INF treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev treaty from 1987, also a severe threat to Russia. And to show how serious he was about it, he immediately uh, launched uh, uh, missiles that violated the treaty. Uh, he also eliminated the Open Skies Treaty. Uh, the last remaining treaty was the New START Treaty. He was about to get rid of that, but didn't have quite time. Uh, Biden came in literally within days of the, ex of the expiration of the extension of the treaty that the Russians had been calling for, and Biden did uh, renew the treaty. Now the Russians have suspended participation, not withdrawing from it. Uh, but uh, it's pretty hard to think of anything else that wasn't a pretty extreme hawkish position, often going beyond, even beyond what Trump did in some ways, like China. Uh, you, you mentioned... Uh you know, all, all these uh, really risky and, and um, uh, dangerous, dis you know, dismantling of, of arms control treaties. And recently the doomsday clock was set to 90 seconds, and this is the closest it's ever been to, to midnight. Uh, how serious is the threat of nuclear war in your opinion? And, and I know that's sort of a rhetorical question, but, uh, you know, President Biden and President Putin have both said that we are closer uh, than ever before to nuclear war, which, which includes the Cold War. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, um, it's a lot to take in. Do you agree with their assessment? I think 90 seconds to midnight is uh, unfortunately a fair assessment. You might remember that the, uh, the clock was always, which was started in 1947, also was always was set in minutes. Uh, the last years of the Trump administration gave up on minutes, moved to seconds. Now it's even closer. Uh, if you take a look at the U Europe situation, Ukraine situation, just take a look at the logic of it. Uh, by now, it's pretty hard to dismiss the position of most of the world that it's a proxy war between the United States and Russia with Ukrainian bodies on the line. Yeah. Uh, been resisting that, but by now it's pretty hard to deny. The US government has recognized officially that US forces are now directly involved in targeting the high precision weapons that are the main, uh, the most effective weapons that Ukrainians have. Uh, tanks are being set, jet planes aren't very much in the distance. If you look at the logic of the situation, Russia and the United States, to the two major huge uh, 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 nuclear powers, uh, they can each destroy everything with a tiny fraction of their nuclear arsenals. One Trident submarine, US submarine, is supposed to be able to destroy about 200 cities anywhere in the world, and it's a tiny fraction of it. Well, here you have two nuclear powers faced off. Uh, neither of them can be defeated because each can raise the ante as much as they like up to termination. Might decide not to do it, but they certainly can. So basically neither can be defeated and neither 
will agree at the current stage to negotiations. It's a death sentence. That's species suicide. Uh, the US position is uh, we should not enter into negotiations. We must continue the war in order to weaken Russia. In fact, to weaken Russia severely so that it cannot undertake any aggressive actions in the future. I don't know how you succeed in doing that without uh, turning Russia into a agricultural society or maybe balkanizing it. But the US position is war has to go on. Uh, Putin has uh, annexed territories that weren't even contested and controversially belonged to Ukraine. Uh, so they're both committed to continuing the war. Each has the capacity to raise the ante without limits. Neither is willing to uh, agree to being defeated. What's the conclusion? Suicide, total suicide. There's only one way out. It's the way that almost the entire world is calling for, except for the in the West, the United States, Britain, German leaders, not the populations. The answer is move towards some sort of diplomatic settlement, right. which will keep uh, at least put, put an end to escalating the horrors and destruction. Uh, the worst victims in the short run will be Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, as the war, they're already suffering a huge number of military casualties. Apparently not that many civilian casualties, but military casualties are enormous. The economy is going into a tailspin. Uh, it goes on, increase the level of hostilities. It's hard to see how they can fail to suffer severely. Russia's lost tens of thousands of soldiers. Uh, in fact, most of the world, almost the entire world is losing. Uh, countries around the world that depend on grain sh fertilizer shipments from the Black Sea region, lots of starvation. Yeah. Uh, the Europe is declining significantly from the sanctions and the cutoff of its natural trading and commercial partner, which is in the East, the European uh, industrial system, German-based industrial system, was based extensively on uh, ties with Russia for raw materials and resources, and of course, with the huge China market behind. All of that's declining. Uh, one country in the world has been gaining, the United States. Uh, take a look at the executive offices of fossil fuel producers, uh, military producers, the uh, banks that are uh, funding them, I and mean, the euphoria is unsustained. Yeah. New fossil fuel fields being opened for exploration. We can race to destroying human society with huge profits. I mean, it's just perfect. Uh, meanwhile, uh, with a fraction of the colossal military budget, the US is significantly degrading the military forces of its one military adversary. It's a bargain. Uh, not so great for the population, but they're not parties to decision making. And uh, uh, that's pretty much where we stand. Do you, so do you agree that this conflict could have been entirely prevented through diplomacy? Because uh, what a lot of people cite is uh, in December 2021, the Russians sending uh, these uh, uh, documents, uh, you know, basically pleading with uh, the Americans to uh, not put their troops on in in NATO countries bordering Russia uh, to you know to uh, forego Ukrainian uh, membership in NATO. Do do you agree that this you know if the United States are potentially engaged that the conflict could have been avoided? And uh, how do you see this ultimately ending? Because you know one way or another it has to come to an end. Um, what, what do you think it's going to look like? That's certainly you can't prove it, but. The United States did officially say they're not taking Russian security consideration, uh, security con uh, concerns into consideration. They had taken them into consideration. They had pursued the 
Minsk II agreements. And remember, Minsk II was not a low-level agreement. Mm -hmm. It was the UN Security Council uh, unanimously, including yeah. the United States. Uh, Ukrainians didn't support it. Russian positions, ambiguous. US certainly didn't support it. Uh, that a couple of years ago, that could have provided a, a settlement which would have uh, avoided the um, invasion. Uh, the re rejection of the December 20, 19, uh, 2021 uh, proposals was another step. Uh, I should add that uh, on the Russian side, Emmanuel Macron of uh, President of France was pleading with Putin up to the last minute uh, not to invade and to consider alternatives that he was presenting. Uh, we have the transcripts of their uh, of their conversations. They were published in France. Uh, the uh, uh, Putin dis basically dismissed them at the end. Dismissed them with contempt. Said he has to go off ice skating. I can't talk about it anymore. A couple of days later, invaded. So there are no saints in this story by any means. Uh, the responsibility for the aggression is Putin's. He carried out the criminal invasion. There was plenty of provocation, but provocation is not justification. The US stance for years has been to increase the provocation. Worth mentioning that this is over the objections, warnings, of almost the top of the high, the top of the high level, the high level uh, diplomatic uh, 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 elements in the U.S. system. George Kennan, Jack Matlock, Reagan's ambassador to Russia, William Burns, ambassador to Russia, now CIA director, Robert Gates, uh, hawkish defense minister of uh, the Bush administration all warned that it was reckless and provocative to violate what everyone understood were the red lines of any Russian leader, Yeltsin, Gorbachev, anyone, namely not allowing Ukraine into a hostile military alliance. It's no Russian leader is going to accept that and everyone understood it. Uh, so plenty of provocation, no justification. Now we're locked into a situation which, as I mentioned, has the logic of moving to terminal destruction. There's a lot of loose talk about nuclear war. A lot of people don't understand. You have a nuclear war, the country that carries out the first strike will be destroyed yeah. simply by nuclear winter effects, any large scale nuclear war. So talk about nuclear war is just impossible if you want the species to survive. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, gee, Einstein had a nice statement about this not long before his death. He was asked uh, what, he, what weapons did he think might be used in World War III. He said, I don't know about World War III, but World War IV will be fought with stone axes. That's about it. I should say that less discussed, but in many ways even more dangerous, is the escalation of tensions in the Pacific. Uh, right. The United States is carrying out highly provocative acts against China. China so far not reacting, but could begin to. Uh, this is, in fact, almost outlandish what's being said. One top US Air Force general Mm -hmm. a couple of days ago, said that uh, we're going to be at war with China in two years. You can't be at war with China. You're all dead. There's no such thing. Uh, Marines are now being uh, trained in island hopping, Iwo Jima type training. Exactly. Yeah. Just ludicrous. If there's a war with China, nobody's going to care about islands. <laughs> uh, the US is... Uh, the official terminology under Biden expanded it is to encircle China with sentinel states armed with 
high precision weapons, US weapons aimed at China, that's a ring of states, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia. Uh, the US has recently dispatched uh, B-52s, nuclear capable B-52s for permanent installation in uh, Darwin, Australia. That's yeah. flight distance to China in Guam. Uh, uh, the main flashpoint is Taiwan. Uh, we have a, there is an agreement between China and the United States on Taiwan back in the 1970s. The agreement is, it's called the One China Policy. Both sides agree that Taiwan is legally part of China. Both sides agree not to take forceful, provocative measures to disrupt the existing situation. It's held for 50 years. That's a pretty impressive record in international right. affairs. It's now collapsing. Uh, again, no saints, but the United States is well in the lead in the provocations. Uh, there are just reckless acts like uh, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, raising the diplomatic level, probably followed by Kevin McCarthy, so he says, current House Speaker, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, passed legislation, uh, Taiwan Policy Act, which calls for giving Taiwan the status of any non-NATO ally, every country outside of NATO, no special diplomatic limitations. Meanwhile, increase in military spending, military supplies to Taiwan, advanced weapons, uh, interoperability of weapon systems. Uh, China has reacted by symbolically, by carrying out naval maneuvers, which show what's obvious that it can blockade and strangle Taiwan if it has to. Uh, all of this, meanwhile, the most serious thing is that the United States under Biden recently has essentially declared an economic war against China, dedicated legislation to uh, policy to ensure that to try to prevent China's economic development, its technological development, by demanding that uh, US companies and companies around the world not provide China with any technology that has any US components in it. And the way supply chains are designed, that's everything. This is a pretty, first of all, it's, it's highly provocative towards China saying, we're just gonna stop your economic development with advanced technology. But it's also very harmful to US allies. So take say the Netherlands, Netherlands happens to have the most biggest, most sophisticated uh, lithographic industry, which provides essential parts for semiconductors right. and basis of the modern high technology. Well, if they lose the China market, it's a pretty severe blow for them. Same with Samsung in South Korea, same with Japanese advanced industry. It's kind of uncertain at the moment whether they're going to accept these orders, but if they, usually people give in to US orders, no matter what, it's too dangerous not to, but it's a pretty severe blow to them. Europe's already declining because of the sanctions, uh, the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline just before the Russian invasion was another sign that we're going to cut off your relations with uh, Russia, you're in our pocket, and Putin helped. The invasion gave the United States its most treasured gift on a silver platter, Europe. Uh, instead of moving towards some kind of independence back in US pocket. In fact, with your, Europe in its, its pocket, the United States has now extended NATO to the Indo-Pacific region. North Atlantic now includes the Indo-Pacific, everything, all the world's yeah. oceans. Uh, part of the, that's basically enlisting Europe in the Biden's growing war against China. The dangers there are 
at least as serious as in Europe. Sir, have you been reading my questions? Because you answered, I think, next to, I was going to ask you about China and um, uh, also about the, the pipeline. Uh, regarding China, I mean, all this hostility, uh, I think the balloon was, was, you know, the least of it. The, the examples that you mentioned were, were uh, on, a, on a diplomatic level and economic level far, far more uh, escalatory. Do you think that, that this stems from, um, uh, you know, fear of, of, of competition because of China's rapid growth? Uh, and do you think it also has something to do with China's uh, good ties with Russia and, you know, being a BRICS country and, um, you know, the, the United States essentially uh, uh, fearing any sort of competition being the world's hyperpower at the moment? Well, it's worth remembering how isolated the United States is outside of the English-speaking countries and European elites, not so much the population, which is quite divided, but European elites, except for a little bit for France, are going along with the United States. That's about it. Uh, the rest of the world is not. About 90% uh, of the world's population is not accepting the sanctions. Uh, there was a major conference a couple of weeks ago in Munich, Munich Strategic Conference. The, uh, United States was trying hard to get the global south to uh, to enlist them in our in the US campaign in Ukraine no takers one country after another got up and said we're not part of your war we want a peaceful settlement we want an end to the horrors instead of escalation uh, in India, Indonesia, Brazil, Colombia, Africa, right down the line. Uh, Kamala Harris, the US vice president who was head of the US delegation, uh, instructed them that, as she put it, no country in the world is safe when one state can invade another. They practically collapsed in ridicule. The United States is saying that. I mean, here when people say it, you don't laugh. It's a well indoctrinated society. But tell that to anybody in the global south? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a joke. <laughs> so they're polite. They don't say you're full of crap, but uh, they just politely say, we're not going along with you. We're going to continue trading with Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to continue trading with China. We're going to set up alternative modes of commercial interaction, including alternative currency interactions, slowly getting off the dollar-based system. And uh, there's no way the U.S. can stop that. Can't stop it with the guns. That's yep. U.S. comparative advantages. Military works for a lot of things, but not for this. Meanwhile, China's just quietly proceeding with its large development projects, uh, infrastructure, loans, uh, building all the, the Belt and Road Initiative through Eurasia, extending into Africa, uh, extending to the Middle East. Actually, even Israel's part of it. China owns part of a major port which is a U.S. military base, they don't like it, but China owns half the Haifa port, and extending, a, there's a maritime Silk Road along with a, right. one inside Russia. It goes right through the United Arab Emirates, which is a key point in it. They're part of it. Saudi Arabia, others are repairing their relations. They're not abandoning their relations with Russia getting better relations with China. Uh, it's right in Latin America. U.S. can't stop it. It's own backyard. China's now the major trading partner. It tries hard, but it's too much appeal. So, you know, it's just doing everything to try to stop this, including the almost war, namely the trying to stop Chinese industrial technological development. This is 100% supported in the United States, almost at the leadership level. 
bipartisan. Yeah. But uh, and uh, you just can't, and you can't talk about it. Can't discuss it in the media. Uh, everything's yellow peril, like this balloon business. I mean, what's what's the balloons? I mean, quietly the Pentagon conceded that the balloon was blown off course, but they said anyway it was a danger because it might be inspecting U.S. military facilities. Um, if the Chinese are down to balloons to inspect military facilities, they're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure their satellites get everything they need. <laughs> Plus, uh, but th this became a huge incident, you know, balloons. All of... It's very dangerous. And the United States intellectual opinion is so closed, you just can't talk about it. I mean, you can in a few places. Like, uh, interestingly, the if you take a look at the major establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, there you actually can find a couple of articles that say we just have to work towards uh, some sort of diplomatic settlement. We just can't go on just raising the ante for war, but it doesn't reach mainstream discourse. Incidentally, it's not only this, it's also the past. It's now 20 years since the US invaded Iraq. Mm. Here's something you might try. Try to find one sentence, not asking a lot, one sentence anywhere near the mainstream that says invasion of Iraq was a crime. Can't do it. Yeah. It was a mistake, too costly. <laughs> uh, it's not like when other countries carry out invasions. Yeah. When we do it, it's a benign effort. In fact, the whole Iraq invasion has been reconstructed as a kind of mercy mission to save Iraqis in the world from Saddam Hussein. And you quietly, you don't mention the fact that, yes, Saddam was a monstrous dictator and we supported him through yeah. all of his worst crimes. That part is four letter words, can't pronounce them. Uh, we're coming to 50 years since the peace treaty, so-called, to end US participation in the Vietnam War. Same exercise, try to find one sentence in the mainstream that says this was something worse than a mistake. Yeah. What are called dovish articles, like the current issue of foreign affairs, main article by Andrew Bacevich, kind of dove, very critical of US foreign policy, never did anything beyond a mistake. It was too costly for us. That's pretty impressive. In fact, it goes beyond that. Again, you don't talk about it. I mean, imperial states commonly deny their crimes. That's yeah. not unusual. They don't usually commemorate their crimes. Well, right now, one of the most atrocious acts in the US invasion of Iraq was the attack on Fallujah, the Marine yes. attack on Fallujah, especially the second attack, yeah. murderous, brutal attack. The US Navy just commissioned its most recent amphibious assault vessel. It's named the USS Fallujah. Oh, you're joking. If you look at the official US Navy statement, they say we're commemorating the courage and uh, uh, of the Marines who carried out this noble uh, defense of Fallujah. I mean, it doesn't get reported in the United States, but it does outside. You can read about it in Al Jazeera, for example. You can read the response of Iraqis, which is, of course, infuriated, but I mean, the, the United States is insulated. The depleted United uranium States, alone they is, don't is things like that. Yeah, the, the, there's still babies born to this day with birth defects in Fallujah because of the depleted Deleted. uranium. Yes, I, I, uranium, I'm shocked. But also white phosphorus. Yeah. US, uh, there's still 
you know, miscarriages from people. White phosphorus just burns you up. When it hits a person, you just burn up. Uh, it's a criminal weapon, was used widely in uh, Fallujah, and it apparently lasts, uh, has genetic effects which last like depleted uranium. So there's still people Horrible. 20 years later dying of cancer. So we therefore commemorate it by commissioning our, the latest ship, the USS Fallujah. And here you don't hear about it. Try to find a word. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you touched on a very important point, sir, is that I, I, I um, and I've raised this in the past, is that in, in Britain and, and the United States, uh, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, they're, they're foreign policy blunders or, uh, uh, like you said, mistakes, or they were too costly, but they never actually address them as, as crimes. And yet when it comes to Russia, Ukraine, uh, suddenly everyone has the clarity to, you know, call that for what it is and talk about international law. And it's, it's highly Absolutely. ironic. Enemy crimes, we understand. They are crimes. Our crimes are never crimes. As I say, that's imperial, the imperial record, although it's kind of rare not to have anyone comment on it. Mm. Usually there's people off in the margins who say something. Uh, I mean, it's you can say, like I can say it, it's a free country. They're not going to send in the secret police to drag me off to prison, but nobody can get anywhere near the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, sir, if I could, if I could just touch on the, uh, um, you, cause you, you were mentioning Saudi Arabia earlier and all these countries that are uh, basically maintaining and continuing their, their trade and ties with Russia. Um, what, what did you think of the recent G7 price cap uh, on Russian oil? Because as far as I can tell, it hasn't capped a single barrel. And, um, you know, the Chinese and the Indians continue to buy the Rus uh, you know, Russian oil in, in, um, in droves. And uh, how does this relate to the, the petrodollar? Uh, are we seeing a decline um, uh, in, the, in the value of the dollar in the future, perhaps? Because I know recently all the currencies have gone down vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. But... Uh, how, how does that uh, relate to the to the future of, of the U.S. currency and, and specifically the petrodollar? It's hard to say. I mean, the, the petrodollar has been a very important part of uh, U.S. foreign policy. There's a deal with Saudi Arabia, the main oil producer. Uh, the U.S. would back them in everything, and uh, they would uh, price... Uh, uh, oil exports in dollars and everyone else followed. Uh, that gives the U.S. considerable flexibility in world trade and also foreign policy. The U.S. can borrow freely, can run debts and so on. The dollar's safe. Uh, the, I mean, there is debate about how significant this is. All economists aren't mm -hmm. uniform about it, but general assumption is that that's uh, that a US based currency gives the US enormous power there are some respects in which it's obvious uh, the United States is the only country in the world that can uh, uh, launch uh, sanctions like thunderbolts anywhere it wants and when the US imposes a sanction it's a third party sanction other countries have to obey it whether they like it or not right one form of punishment the u.s can carry out is to throw them out of the international financial system which is run from new york and washington that's the dollar-based system the world may oppose the sanctions so let's say cuba for example uh the united states has imposed extremely harsh sanctions to try to strangle, destroy Cuba. The world is 100% opposed. If you look at the UN votes, there's a vote every year in the General Assembly, unanimously opposed, only Israel votes with the United States and they have to. Uh, doesn't make any difference, barely even gets reported. They obey the sanctions. It's yeah. too dangerous not to. The same with the Iran sanctions that Trump imposed and that uh, Biden's extended. Europe doesn't like them at all. 
said so openly, but they abide by them. Well, if you start developing more complex, uh, multipolar, uh, commercial, uh, financial arrangements, that's all going to decline. Uh, even during the aftermath of the earthquake, they, I mean, they, they made these waivers uh, <laughs> and, and so-called exemptions, but which, you know, changed nothing. But in Syria, for example, uh, most European countries just completely ignored uh, sending yeah. any aid. Well, it was shocking. Still is. Yep. In fact, the uh, Congress just passed an extension of the Caesar Act, the very harsh sanctions which are destroying the Syrian population. They don't harm the leadership. In fact, sanctions almost never do. Right. Leadership enriches itself, doesn't care. But the population suffers severely. And Syria's, oh, it's been a horrible situation for years, but can't get out of it. It's getting worse. Uh, there's a recent report from Damascus by a very good journalist, uh, Charles Glass, has been in and out of Syria for a long time. He just describes it as a total wreckage. Congress just passed bipartisan, both including the progressive people in Congress, voted almost unanimously to extend the sanctions that are destroying the Syria's population even yeah. after the earthquake. It's horrific. Yeah. And, I'm glad that you said so-called exemptions because they were very slight and temporary. You got to torture the population because the U.S. doesn't like the government. Much of what of this is, I mean, we talk about the invasion of Iraq, which was monstrous, but the 10 years before were equally bad. I mean, U.S. Yeah. sanctions were devastating Iraqis. Uh, the the UN was administering the sanctions. They're basically US sanctions. The, there were two administrators, highly regarded international diplomats, Irish, Dennis Halliday, German, Hans von Sponek. They both resigned in protest. They both called the uh, sanctions genocidal, their word. Hans von Sponek, wrote a very important book about it, the most detailed, careful book about Iraq during the 1990s. He had inspectors on the ground, lots of information. It's called A Different Kind of War. Can't find it in the United States. I don't think there was a single review of it. Too important. And it, what did you think of Israel also striking Syria? Because they, they did that a few days after the, the earthquake. And I, I know it was Damascus, so Damascus wasn't as badly hit. But, you know, the country is still under sanctions and uh, it, it still takes a toll. Israel does whatever it likes, as long as the United States backs it up and uh, provides the weapons and the support. Uh, Israel feels free to do whatever it likes tax uh, Syria, and repeatedly invaded Lebanon, uh, overflowed for Lebanon, uh, feels free to do what it wants. That was when Israel had a more or less normal government, moderately democratic for Jews at least. Now with the far right uh, Radical, uh, religious extremist government. Right, I wanted Nobody, to ask you about that. In fact, they've been saying the leadership, Smotrich, Ben Gvir, have even been telling the United States, we don't care what you say, we're going to do what we want. And meanwhile, the Biden administration gives them stronger and stronger support. It's interesting also to see, uh, uh, you mentioned the progressives earlier uh, furthering uh, the sanctions on Syria. And, you know, I, I, I repeatedly see them play musical chairs when it comes to Israeli support. You know, they'll, they'll oppose one thing and then next time they'll vote for it. Uh, 
you know, I, this is part of a broader question, I suppose. It's that why is the left failing uh, in the United States and, and the United Kingdom? Because the, the, what we have as left is basically, you know, neoliberalism. Um, what, why do you think the left is failing? What does it have to do differently to actually enact uh, meaningful change like, uh, you know, like, like the 19... Uh, the, the, so the 1930s when they, they brought in, you know, social security and paid leave and all these things in Europe and, and in the U.S. Don't, don't you feel that there was a much stronger left back then as well? Well, first of all, let's take, start with Britain. There is a powerful left. And it was on its way towards developing an authentic, popular-based, participatory political party, labor party, which would actually respond to the needs of its constituents. They won a major victory in 2017, mm. so much so that they terrified the whole establishment across the board, all the way over to the Guardian, got together, launched a major campaign to undermine and destroy it. That's Jeremy Corbyn's labor party which was succeeding for the first time in decades to develop a Labour Party that was not just a pale shadow of the Tories. And it was very successful. Couldn't accept it. Um, they launched an outlandish, outrageous campaign about anti-Semitism and the Labour Party. You raised the anti-Semitism, everybody gets worried, Holocaust and so on. Uh, it worked amazingly. It was all a fraud. It's all been exposed. Detailed exposures. You can read the exposures in detail in Al Jazeera. Right, labor files. Yep. Okay. Uh, the labor files that they published. It was published in England too, but the press disregarded it. No one it. covered it, yeah. It's... Uh, uh, we got to destroy that chance for a left party. Can't be tolerated. There was something kind of similar in the United States with Sanders, mm -hmm. the Democratic Party establishment, the Clinton-run Democratic Party, uh, came down on him like a ton of bricks. The media followed along, denouncing him as a crazy guy. Uh, he was the most popular political figure in the United States in 2016, and they couldn't kill him completely. He did manage to gain a, he has a powerful constitu popular constituency among left activists, and he has a strong position in Congress as head of the Senate Budget Office. He's the author of Biden's more progressive programs, all of them shot down by Republican opposition and right-wing Democrats, but uh, nevertheless was significant. But it was kind of similar to what happened in England, less, less extreme, less uh, fanatic, but uh, try to keep them out. So there are major establishment powers that are tr trying to prevent what are called left parties. And remember, left is not very far to the left. Uh, yeah, an editor of the London Financial Times, the world's leading business journal, not exactly a radical rag, and one of the editors, Rana Forahar, sort of half-jokingly, only half-jokingly, said that if Bernie Sanders was a German, he could be running on the Christian Democrat Party, the right-wing party, yeah. which is correct. The things he's calling for every country has right universal health care rich countries poor countries everybody's got it uh free higher education all over the place mexico germany finland uh, yeah so those are the big policies in the united states it's considered very radical you know but uh <laughs> that's a fact about u.s political culture yeah, the, the, this is a Just point that I often raise. It's um, the, you mentioned the New Deal. Yeah. Go back to the 1950s. Uh, the president, Eisenhower, was a conservative. He was strongly in favor of the New Deal. In fact, he went so far as to say that if any political figure in the United States 
opposes New Deal measures that don't belong in the American political system. By now, supporting those measures is way out at the fringe. That's the neoliberal assault of the last 40, 45 years led in England and the United States, other countries following along. It's been a major attack on the population. It's changed the framework of debate discussion enormously. So that now somebody like Sanders is basically a new dealer. It's considered an extreme radical. Eisenhower was not considered an extreme radical. Uh, do, do you believe those are the remnants of McCarthyism that, uh, you know, anyone who's slightly to the left is, is, uh, is mirrored as, uh, you know, Soviets or communist spy or something like that? Because uh, as you said, it's, it's considered radical left or something. Well, right now with the Russophobia, it's more extreme than it's been since the McCarthy days. Uh, you try to express the word negotiations, diplomacy, you're a Putin lover, you know, <laughs> appeasement. That's the same in Germany. Yeah. Uh, Putin for Steyr. You <laughs> understand Putin. It's the worst crime you can imagine. Among German elites, I don't think it's true of the population. There are huge demonstrations in Germany calling yeah. for negotiations. Polls show that the population large majority of the population wants to move towards diplomacy. It's not showing itself in the leadership, except for a few people like Sarah Wackenknecht, a couple of others. Yeah. But uh, the elites in the intellectual world are uniformly Russophobic. Not just my opinion. Why recently. do you think that is? Huh? I'm in the Ukraine war did hit Europe hard. They're attacking people like us, white people, people who are just like us. You want to slaughter brown people, I don't care that much. So, I mean, if you take a look at the uh, Ukraine war, it's a brutal, harsh war. It doesn't come close to Iraq or Yemen what Israel does regularly in Gaza. I mean, yeah. Actually, this is not missed in the South. It's Arundhati not. Roy, famous Indian novelist and essayist, just came out with an article in which she, meant, she said it much more eloquently than I am, but saying that for us, uh, there's no moral issue in Ukraine. Brown and we think brown and black bodies care, matter, matter as much as white ones. Can't understand that in the West. Uh, Just take a look at the way Ukrainian refugees are being welcomed as compared yeah. with Syrian uh, Africans. They can drown in the Mediterranean. We don't care about them. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising that point. It, it's it's extremely uh, potent. And um, Mr. Chomsky, I, I wanted to ask you on that point because you 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 mentioned how there are many people out protesting uh, in Germany, and uh, you know you ha you you had an anti NATO rally recently in London, um, in uh, DC, and I I just want to ask you, uh, what is the anti war movement doing wrong? Uh, how how do they what, what do they need to do to achieve results? Um, and how would you compare them to the uh, anti-war movement during the Vietnam War? Well, first of all, the anti-war movement in Vietnam was very important. But remember, a couple of years, it was very brief and very late. Uh, the Vietnam War was sharply escalated by Kennedy in 1961-62, uh, that's when he started uh, programs driving the war all through the Vietnam War. The main target was the Peasant Society of South Vietnam, 80% hmm. of the population. They were the main target. Started in 61-62, Kennedy uh, launched programs to try to drive peasants into 
what amounted to concentration camps. They didn't call them that, of course, uh, were they surrounded by barbed wire, keep them from supporting the guerrillas who the US intelligence knew that they were supporting, uh, started chemical warfare programs to destroy crops and livestock, uh, authorized napalm, uh, increased the number of American forces, uh, uh, U.S. planes started bombing South Vietnam under South Vietnamese markings, but they were U.S. planes, U.S. Air Force. There was no peace movement, none. I was very much involved myself. You couldn't get five people together to talk about it. It went on for years. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until about 1967 that there was a substantial peace movement. It was substantial. But by that time, uh, South Vietnam had been virtually destroyed. Uh, Bernard Fall, who was the main expert military specialist, no dove, he wrote at that time that he wasn't sure that Vietnam as a historical cultural entity could even survive the most intense bombing any area that size had ever endured. And that was got worse afterwards. Yeah, under Nixon, still worse. Uh, meanwhile, Laos and Cambodia were devastated. Uh, very little. The what the peace movement did develop, and by 1971, 72 was petering out already. So there's a very brief period, intense, important. Took a long time to develop it. Uh, it had a, an effect. It changed the attitudes in the population. So for example, when Reagan came in, he intended to duplicate in Central America what Kennedy had done in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Couldn't too much public opposition. Church groups, popular groups all rose up, had to back off horrible enough, but not Vietnam. Uh, but uh, uh, today, what's, you talk about the left today, first of all, it's split. A large part of the left is saying, uh, got to support Ukraine no matter what, even if it gets to war. It uh, uh, doesn't matter. I can't talk about negotiations. Uh, you're the same line as even more than the right, you know, that's, it's Munich, uh, all the rest, you know the story. So. Uh, other parts of the left are quite active, uh, but uh, split and the popular, the popular movements themselves are split about it because there is a legitimate argument for defense of Ukraine against aggression. Question is, mm -hmm. do you take, do you take a look at the situation and decide what's the way out or do you keep escalating it? Well, that's more subtle than just, uh, you know, out now. So. You, you said the left is split. Do you, do you think that this is a self-inflicted wound? Uh, and, and how do they overcome that? What, what meaningful actions uh, should the anti-war movement take to actually get results? Well, there is part of the... There are parts of the activist movements, which are saying, let's join most of the rest of the world, call for a diplomatic settlement before the horrors get even worse, maybe all the way up to terminal war. Parts are saying that. Uh, but uh, they're, of course, uh, under harsh attack. And the left itself is not joining, much of it is not joining them saying, no, we have to defend a country against uh, criminal aggression. As I say, you can understand the appeal of that till you start thinking it through. I mean, you go to the rest of the world, they also condemn the aggression, but they don't say, let's blow up the world. And they also point out, this is not the first case of aggression in the world. Nobody issued sanctions against the United States when it invaded Iraq, when it destroyed right. Libya, a dozen other cases we can mention. In fact, if you think about it, 
uh, Joe Biden just went on a, a visit to Kiev, followed by Secretary of Treasury. Did any world leader go to Baghdad while the United States and Britain were smashing it to pieces? No. No, you, you can't. You can't think that, let alone say it. Yeah, it's a, the double standard is quite striking. What 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 does that say about uh, Western society that that we cannot see, um, you know, our own actions as as criminal uh, when we do them, and uh, you know, what, what does that say about the level of of intellectual uh, debate and uh, critical thinking skills in the West? When has it been different? Can you think of a time when it was any different? I mean, take the First World War far enough back so that we ought to be able to think about it more or less dispassionately it's over a century. Take a look at the intellectuals during the First World War. In every country, they were overwhelmingly in support of their own state, mm -hmm. almost without exception. There was a fringe of exceptions. Bertrand Russell in England, Rosa, Le Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht in Germany, Eugene Debs in the United States. Yeah. Where were they? In jail. Right. He got his citizenship removed as well. That's, uh, that's, I mean, take England. Uh, hundreds of years of murderous, brutal violence all over the world. Yeah. Only barely beginning to face it now. Just about now, your last couple of years, you're starting to get serious books on uh, the British crimes in India. Yes. Which were no secret. Adam Smith condemned them. And people were condemning them in the 18th century before they even reached anything like their peak. And they were being defended by British intellectuals. John Stuart Mill, others, and talked about how angelic Britain was. Uh, the schools talked about the glories of the British Empire, how much good they were doing for everyone. Yeah, yes, the Indians, many others. Well, that's hundreds of years. France, they still refused to do it. Still talking about the... Yeah, I mean, Macron refuses to apologize for Algeria and, you know, they killed uh, 1.5 million people there. Yeah, yeah. They were taught it's the civilizing mission. It's, uh, <laughs> in that regard, unfortunately, the U.S. is not breaking any new ground. It's a little bit extreme because, you know, things are much freer and much educational levels higher. People know more. But uh, although what is extreme is things like what I mentioned before, uh, commissioning a naval vessel in memory of one of the most atrocious crimes of the Iraq war. That's pretty extreme. Yeah. So much so that I don't think it'll ever be mentioned in the United States, uh, you know, except on the margins I wrote about it. A couple of... uh, would you also uh, put Hiroshima and Nagasaki in there? Because I, I recall the, uh, the admirals who were actually in the Pacific fighting the war. Uh, many of them opposed uh, the uh, you know, nuclear bombs and, and confirmed the... that the Japanese were on the verge of surrender. So this, uh, there, was, well, there was no need for it. Well, the Japanese had pretty much offered the kind of surrender that was reached mm -hmm. at Potsdam. Uh, the last, the only remaining issue, basically, was would the imperial system be preserved? The United States demanded that it be dismantled. Well, the final settlement did preserve it. Could have been reached. Uh, I think there's a reasonable argument that the Hiroshima bombing was intended as a, a lesson to Russia, saying, we got the bomb. and. Uh, in fact, there was a, during the height of the British Empire, the a satirist, uh, Hilaire Belloc, wrote a little ditty about the British Empire, which sort of captured it in a couple of words. He said, whatever happens, 
we have got the Maxim gun and you have not. That's the British Empire. After World War II, an African essayist, Chin Wei Zhu, changed it a little. Whatever happens, we have got the atom bomb and you have not. I think that's part of the reason for Hiroshima. Backfired, of course. Didn't take long for the Russians to get it. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, in retrospect, even at the time, it's hard to find much just any justification for that. Um, even Eisenhower didn't agree that, that it should have thought it shouldn't have been used. Yeah. The Nagasaki bomb was basically an experiment to see if a different kind of bomb will work. The Russians had already entered the war. The war was over. I mean, the last hope of the extreme Japanese militarists was maybe Russia would join them and there would be a negotiated settlement. But after Russia invaded Manchuria, that was over. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chomsky, you, you, you raised, uh, you know, the, um, how, how basically we're not, we're, we're unable to, to look at our own crimes, uh, and, and see them for what they are. And, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, as a, you know, as, as, um, what, what is your opinion about what's happening in Israel? Because there are a lot of protests now, and some people are saying that even the people that are protesting against the Netanyahu uh, a, a government and Ben Gavir, uh, e even that, even I mean, those who call themselves liberal or left in Israel are still oppressing the Palestinians. Uh, would you agree with that assessment? And, and what do you think of all these uh, protests? Well, the protests are important. Netanyahu's right wing government is dismantling the democratic functioning of Israel for Israeli Jews. The system worked pretty well, as well as anywhere, for the privileged part of the population, Israeli Jews. As far as Pal Palestinians in Israel have some rights, second class citizen, but kind of like uh, suppressed populations almost everywhere. Uh, the occupied territories is just, um, it's worse than apartheid. I've never called it apartheid because it's worse than apartheid. Uh, South mm. Africa depended on its black population. 85% of the population, they were the workforce, they needed them. South Africa tried actually to get the banter stands to be recognized, try to make them look viable. Uh, Israel doesn't do that with the Palestinians in the occupied territories, just wants to get rid of them. You know, the, if they'd all leave, that's fine. Uh, I mean, the, what Israel's developing is a kind of classic neo-colonial system. For the privileged elites in Palestine, in the occupied territories, uh, you give them something. So Ramallah is a, functioning city of theaters, restaurants, nice place for the Palestinian elite. The population is scattered into, I think it's now 165 or so separate uh, enclosures surrounded by Israeli forces. May decide to let them pick their crops, maybe not today. Uh, constant settler attack supported by the army. Uh, just recently got unusually brutal, a real pogrom. You take a look at the Supreme Court, the big protests in Israel are about the attack on the Supreme Court. Well, for Israeli Jews, the Supreme Court functioned as a decent legal institution. For the Palestinians, nothing. Supported every crime, uh, occasionally would make a gesture, supported all sorts of activities that the entire world regards as illegal, even the world court regards as illegal, but it doesn't matter, the Supreme Court of Israel supports them, as long as it's a pretext of security. Uh, 
So it had a rotten record in the occupied territories, and that's not a part of the protests. I've been covering the uh, Julian Assange case uh, in London for, for the last couple of years, and I, I was in court when they uh, read out your witness statement, uh, which you submitted in, in favor uh, of uh, Julian's release. Could, could I just ask you, uh, why is it so important, uh, in your opinion, to, to lobby for Julian Assange's release, and, and uh, why is the case against him uh, such a threat to um, press freedoms, uh, not just in the West, but worldwide? Well, first of all, what's happened to him is shocking. He's been essentially imprisoned for seven years now. I visited him in the Ecuadorian embassies. It's, it's not a, it's a small apartment. Yeah. Couldn't even, even a, a prisoner in death row can get out to see the sun. He couldn't. Uh, he, uh, then he was sent off to the high security prison, Belmarsh prison, where he's basically torture. The UN rapporteur on torture called it correctly torture. What's the charge? Skip Dale, uh, $50, you know. But the British are so subordinated to Washington that they'll do anything Washington orders. Put him in a high security prison, uh, under torture, okay. Uh, so one, uh, one uh, matter is just his treatment. The other is what it stands for. Um, it's an attack on why is he being uh, uh, persecuted by the United States? He released information that the US government doesn't want released. It's called journalism. In fact, journals, throughout the world used it. Guardian used it, New York Times used it uh, correctly. There was important information there. So it's a major attack on freedom of press and intended that way. That's quite apart from the vicious treatment. Uh, I'm afraid I really have to stop my batteries dying. <laughs> uh, where can people find your work or follow you uh, online? Well, a lot of it appears and is posted on various sites. Uh, Truthout has a lot of stuff, other places too. And I suppose most bookstores have all your, your work, so <laughs> that'll do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chomsky. It's been an honor and a privilege having you on the program. Thank you very much. Hey, this computer's going to die in about 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Good. Good to talk to you. My pleasure. Everybody, that was Noam Chomsky, uh, who again needs no introduction or outro. Um, and uh, I see we've got a couple thousand people that are watching. Record. Uh, so please make sure that you've hit the like button and uh, please share the interview. Post it on Twitter, post it on Facebook, whatever. Show it to your friends. I I, uh, I really enjoyed it as we got uh, um, we got uh, Noam to touch on, you know practically every every uh, uh subject so thank you very much um if you guys uh, uh would like i'll probably be going live uh, tomorrow evening and um we can uh, talk about all the latest news so uh make sure that you have the bell icon ticked so you get a notification when we're actually going live and um uh, otherwise there's there's also the uh, sub stack you'll get an email notification you just put in your e your e type you type in your email you hit subscribe and you'll get um a notification uh so yeah thank you very much guys uh please support the show if you can there are links to paypal um you know uh cash app whatever you name it bitcoin it's all it's all in the chat so uh thank you very much for tuning in and uh, i'll see you guys next time take care bye bye Sweden uh, wanted to, to join NATO. They broke with their, uh, you know, decades long uh, neutral stance. Turkey was one of the only countries, uh, I think, along with Hungary, that was saying, we're not going to let you in because you need to have consensus, right? You need all, all the members in NATO to say, OK, you can join. Their bid has kind of been in limbo because Turkey wanted to, you know, extract several concessions. It was very clear that 
they really want to join NATO in Sweden. And they were doing everything, everything they could to appease the Turks. And then this moron comes in front of the Turkish embassy and burns the Quran. I understand that in their point of view, this is freedom of expression. And, uh, you know, you're in Sweden, you can do whatever you like. But you, you have to remember that if you're trying to get Turkey support, maybe wait until after you've gotten it. I mean, this is this is just dumb from a, a, you know, a diplomatic level. They're doing everything to appease Turkey. And then because of of one idiot, they, they let this go to waste. The Germans and the Americans have decided that it would be a good idea to send Ukraine tanks, you know, German tanks uh, against the Russian man. I'm perplexed by this, you know, I, uh, what, what do they think is going to happen? Because even if you can train the crews, the Ukrainian crews who are used to Soviet tanks to operate British tanks, and then you got to train them to operate German tanks, and then you got to train them to operate American tanks. And that's if they can even uh, maintain the logistical supply line to work with these tanks to, to keep them running. What kind of door are you opening now for the Russians to do? I mean, th this is... This is very clearly escalation. While Germany and, and the US are saying, yeah, we're going to give Ukraine tanks, the doomsday clock has been moved to 90 seconds to midnight. So th this is basically, it's a measurement of how close we are to the end of the world, to the apocalypse, to annihilating uh, the planet with, with nuclear weapons, right? And this is the closest it's ever been to midnight, okay? Midnight representing the end. Ukraine's most senior military commander, has said that his forces need about 300 Western tanks. Over the last year, NATO allies in Eastern Europe supplied Ukraine with Soviet-era and Russian-made tanks that have been ground down or destroyed in constant fighting. Soviet-era and Russian-made tanks. Now, Ukraine, having been uh, a Soviet uh, satellite state and part of the Soviet Union, it was, it was part of Russia, you know, all of its military personnel being trained on Russian tanks. What do you think they're going to do with, with American tanks or German tanks? which they are not trained to operate. The Ukrainians know how to operate Russian tanks. That's all they know how to operate. The Ukrainians only use Soviet stuff, right? Until the last couple of years and until now. You know, this is the first major influx of, of NATO weapons. And, and, and again, NATO has been training Ukrainian forces, but Challenger tanks, this is brand new. If they can't even use the tanks that they are trained, what, what makes you so confident they're gonna know how to use a Leopard 2 or an M1A2 or a Challenger 2? Man, people train on those things for fucking months and years. Both of these home secretaries, okay, Suela Braverman and Priti Patel, both their parents came to the United Kingdom and under their own laws as home secretary, they themselves would not have been able to, to come to the UK, to be born in the UK and, and to have a life there. So like the hypocrisy is so disgusting, you know, like I got what I wanted. I'm okay. I'm secure. I can live in the UK. I'm the home secretary now. Now I'm going to shut the gates. Now I'm going to screw uh, people that have literally nothing that that are so desperate they're, you know, risking drowning in the channel or the Mediterranean Sea. People have to resort to risking drowning. They have to resort to, you know, hiding in trucks or swimming across the channel if everyone's ever done that, uh, you know, uh, crossing the channel because of her policies, because she forces people into doing that. Right. So you have you literally have no choice. You have to be in the UK to begin the application. But what are people supposed to do? Just teleport, you know, for five minutes, write down the form and just get out of the UK. This is ridiculous. She's a liar, just like, the one, uh, you know, her predecessor, Purdue Patel. Why is Germany reluctant to give the Ukrainians tanks? That's a really tough one. I wonder why. Germany has long refused to send its most potent weapons to countries in conflict, a byproduct of its legacy of starting World War II and World War One. That's horse manure, uh, because uh, Germany does send weapons to countries in war. May, you know, Saudi Arabia is one of them. Uh, so to get around this, the trick that they use is they don't they don't sell the tanks and the you know the ordnance directly to Saudi Arabia. They move it to Italy, and then from Italy they sell it to the Saudis. So they basically just insert a middleman, and that's how they get around this very, you know, honorable uh, 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 principle of theirs, which they never abide by. Uh, you know, if you go and you look up the Yemen war, I mean, you're going to see weapons from, from fucking everywhere. You know, the Canadians have been selling weapons and making money, uh, Britain, the US, um, Australia, everyone. And the Germans are no exception. So, so, I mean, this is, the idea is true, but they fucking send weapons. They goddamn do. They do. Do you, do you see how they move like snakes? Do you see how they move like snakes? They get the media to whisper in your ear, oh, don't go on strike. No, no, don't strike, don't strike. It'll cripple the economy. Oh. No, it's, it's, it's not, you know, like giving the army 800 billion to, to fucking bomb, you know, 
uh, 20 countries that that's that's okay that money we can spare that but if you go on strike we're oh my god we're gonna lose like two billion a day well we can't afford that you know you know the pentagon has been audited i think five times now and and every single audit was failed that means they don't know where the money's going. The, 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 the Pentagon is like a black fucking hole that sucks trillions of dollars. And the, the government, the government doesn't even know where the money's going. I can, I can tell you where it's going. You don't need to audit the Pentagon. I can tell you me, Richard Medhurst. That money is going towards uh, drug deals, towards arms sales, towards arms purchases, towards CIA bu fucking budgets and embassy uh, uh, coffee. That's where that shit is going, man. That shit is going to the spooks. That shit's going to the bombers. That shit's going to the paramilitaries. That's where it's going. I get, there's, there, you don't need to scratch your head. That's where it's going. And apparently that's an acceptable loss. That's an acceptable use of American dollars and taxpayer dollars. But you know, going on strike, oh, that's too much of an inconvenience. That's the fucking point, man.